Hello everyone and welcome to the back room. Wouldn't you agree that these iMac G3s are absolutely gorgeous and iconic Macintosh computers? Beauty of course is in the eye of the beholder but for me they certainly hold their own alongside any desirable Mac since the first compact Mac in 1984. I've had a tray loading Bondi Blue example which was the first model of these iMacs for many years now but this second generation slot loading tangerine machine came to me relatively recently. I went to pick up a Mac Plus acquired locally from Facebook Marketplace and the owner also had this computer. 20 quid changed hands and I gleefully carried it home. It's complete with a matching keyboard and a hockey puck mouse but despite having this sticker on the side proclaiming that it had passed an electrical test in June 2007, the machine unfortunately doesn't work. Like so many of these G3s, it is completely dead. There's absolutely no response to the power switch or the keyboard. Now there are numerous forum threads suggesting all kinds of cures such as leaving the machine plugged into a power outlet for a few days and I have to say a variation of that simple trick actually revived my pocket PC and you can check out that machine in an earlier video on the channel. But unfortunately it has done nothing for this computer. As you can see, if I turn it around for a moment and press the switch nothing at all. It is completely dead. Fortunately the service manual is readily available online and there are a number of tests and suggestions to help bring it back to life or at the very least narrow down the problem. And given that this is Marchintosh what better time to try to see if I can revive this beautiful computer. So follow along with me and let's see if Apple's own technical docs can revive this lovely G3. The first thing to do is to turn it upside down, open it up and replace the battery followed by resetting the PMU chip. Now I removed the battery as soon as I got this machine home and that's always a good idea by the way because uh, many old Macs still have their original batteries in place and your first step should always be to remove them. It, after all it may be uh, several months before you get to uh, work on the computer. So turning the machine over will also give you access to the model information label stuck on the bottom here. And uh, in this case, I can see that we have a Tangerine G3 running at 400 megahertz with 128 megs of RAM. There is a 10 gig hard drive and it has a DVD optical drive. To remove the battery or change the memory, you can open the trap door here. There's a simple lock which you can turn with a key, uh, with a coin, sorry. And, and then this little trap door folds down and here is the uh, RAM which you can change very easily. However, unfortunately the battery is tucked away up here and uh, although you can just about reach it, you'll need to have very nimble fingers or some long forceps. I try to remove the battery this way by just uh, opening this flap and of course I drop the battery down inside the casing. Fortunately, opening the computer is actually quite simple. So let's go ahead and do that. Now there are a couple of screws here to take out. These, by the way, are just very small. Two on the bottom here. And now we remove another trap door. If you get in a flat bladed screwdriver just into this little opening here and pry it, you will find that this flap comes off and reveals the external monitor port. Set this aside. There are two further screws here. 
and these are larger. And then you ought to be able to hinge off the plastic and pull it gently down and away from the computer. That will reveal this uh, interference screen here. And now we have a number of screws to remove to release this. We can pop the shield out, just lift it very gently over the external monitor connector there, and off it comes. This can be quite tricky to put back on actually, but with a bit of twisting and turning, it will eventually go back into place. Now, here is the battery holder. And the first thing, as I said, we're going to do is replace the battery here. You can see I'd already taken it out, as I said earlier. I'm going to replace the battery reset the PMU and then give the machine a try. If not, there are a number of test points on the board here, which we can try to make sure it is receiving power. And then beyond that, we'll be looking at capacitors and any other failed components. Okay, so placing the battery, let's just make sure this one is good. 3.6 volts, that's what we want. Notice that uh, plus is at this end, it's marked here. It's also marked on the battery carrier itself. Don't want to put that in in the wrong way. Okay. Now to reset the uh, PMU, there is a switch here, which is designated S1 or switch one. We want to press this switch once and once only. There are dire warnings against pressing this more than once. Make sure the power cord is out. Press the switch. Leave it for 10 seconds. Plug in power cord. Try with the switch. Nothing at all. Now, once the power cord is plugged in, even without the machine switched on, there should be a five volt trickle power available on the uh, logic board here. And we can test this with a multimeter by accessing this test point here, this pad here, and this ground here. And we're seeing 1.4, 1.5 volts there. Now, as I'm sure you can hear everyone, I uh, lost my voice about two weeks ago, just after recording the first part of this video. Uh, now I've come back to it. My voice is almost back, but still not pleasant to listen to. So I propose from this point on not saying very much. If there's something that I need to point out in the process of stripping the machine, I will put it up as a caption on the screen rather than trying to explain it. And I think that might be uh, make for a, a more enjoyable video than listening to me sounding like this. Unfortunately, a voltage reading around one and a half volts will absolutely stop this machine from booting. And it's a classic pointer to a problem with the power and analog board. It would seem that a complete strip down will be required to locate whatever is keeping this Mac from booting. 
Now there are four boards inside the G3 comprising the logic board, which is this, the DCB down converter board, which is this, and the power and video board, which is on the other side of this metal screen here, uh, which you can't quite see. And there is of course a neck board attached to the CRT. It's certainly true to say that some of these boards are easier to remove from the computer than others. But before stripping the machine, there is just one more check to make. With G3 plugged in but not powered up, there should be a voltage of around minus 1.2 volts at capacitor C10, which is just here on the logic board. Now the voltage at C10 can be an indicator of a good or bad logic board, according to Apple's service manual. So we'll check that voltage see what we get, and then proceed from there. About minus 0.8 volts. So just a little bit under what it should be showing at minus 1.2. So having done that, it looks like a strip down is required. We'll need to get at the power and video board, and it'll probably be a recap, but we'll see how we go.
Okay, so having come this far and having tested the fuse on the power and video analog board, the fuse is fine, which means there is a fault uh, elsewhere on the board. And it's either going to be capacitors or there's a very real possibility it could be the flyback. Now, if the flyback is damaged, if it's uh, shorted, then there really is no going back from that. Uh, there's no way to repair it. I would have to try and source a new one. But we'll continue with the strip down. Uh, this is the hardest part, by the way, removing the power and analog video board. But it's simple enough as long as you take your time. So the first thing to do in the step to removing the power and analog board is to detach the microphone connector here. And then unwind the cable ties which hold the degaussing coil in place. And in that way we can lift the degaussing coil out of the way and gain access At last, with the power and analog board freed from the parent G3 and on the bench, I can begin to check the components, principally the electrolytic capacitors. Unfortunately, at first glance, there is no obvious bulging or leaking anywhere on the board. And that is rather a shame because it's generally held that the most likely cause of failure on the PAV board, the power and video analog board, is the LOPT, the Line Output Transformer, or for those of you in the US, the flyback. If nothing else is broken, that could very well be the culprit, and that would spell the end for the repair of this G3. 
Without owning an LOPT tester, which is a meter-like device which essentially injects an oscillating signal into the flyback and measures the echo known as ringing, there are very few meaningful checks that can be made to determine whether the flyback is good or bad. You can check continuity with a multimeter, but frankly even a positive result is largely meaningless because the windings within are very fine and can short under load. Oh well, let's give it a shot and see if I can find anything obviously bad. Now the one thing I can see immediately is this large resistor which is definitely corroded. So we'll put a multimeter across that and check. So I'm getting a reading of around 60 kilo ohms and this resistor has, let me see, violet red black red and a gold tolerance band which if i check an online resistor calculator because i don't carry these things around in my head suggests it is 72 kilo ohms now despite these capacitors appearing to be in good condition it's entirely possible that one or more of them is bad so now i'll measure them with an esr meter to see if i can find any that need replacing this large filtering capacitor here which appears to have a bulging top is not in fact bulging in my opinion these these large caps often have this kind of plastic cover over the top here which appears to be bulging but isn't really but we'll check it and see what we find Start by zeroing the ESR meter. A difficulty with these ESR meters is they have such short leads and if you try to extend the leads of course you uh, spoil the signal and they don't work properly so you have to use these small leads that looks fine to me 0 0.011 point zero zero set that's fine absolutely fine okay now there are 30 something capacitors on this board it's 30 something electrolytic capacitors so now it's time to work my way through those and see if we can find any that are bad so having checked all of these capacitors some are marginal most of them seem absolutely fine i'm going to replace the ones which are marginal i may end up replacing all of them so long as i have them in stock which I probably haven't, but we'll find out as I go along. I've made a map and I'm going to mark on this map exactly what comes from where and what its value is. Not all of these have been measured in circuit because they're just difficult to get to. Apologies for the noise of the desoldering gun, uh, which you can hear kind of chugging away in the background. Now, a little tip if you have uh, capacitors with these blobs of hot glue on them rather than trying to melt that glue the best thing you can do is to use some IPA a little squirt of IPA will actually loosen that glue and enable you away from the board and then to pull it off with some pliers that is the best way to do it certainly makes less mess than trying to melt the glue
And out she comes. And here we are, no fewer than 33 capacitors later, and everyone is removed from the board. Ordinarily, I wouldn't remove components that might very well be perfectly sound, but many of these were difficult to measure in circuit, and now they're removed, testing will be much simplified. To that end, I've temporarily bagged up the capacitors and as I test each cap I will log it and make a list to put on screen to make your experience easier. What is very annoying is that there is almost no two caps alike. With a couple of exceptions almost every capacitor is rated with a different value or voltage. At this stage I'm pretty sure there are some I don't have in stock and so I'll end the video here and return when I have them and the board is recapped. So join me then for the rebuild and the big switch on. Thank you for watching everyone and see you again in the back room.